All right, Florida State football fans, this is your time. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, is 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, and I know that it's only been six weeks now, but uh, I think you know the drill. This is the place to be. Lock it in every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern time. If you want to catch us live, obviously the video after our fine discussion here for the next 50 minutes or so, we'll process and post, and so you can catch us anytime. So if you miss it live, no fear, no issues calm down you can catch the replay but you don't get to li dive into the uh the live chat room and uh shake things up with the rest of the florida state and college football fans we will certainly have uh, miami and florida fans in particular chime in so beware we got uh, jason parker on the line with us as well he is six for six in his appearances here from chop chat Jason, you know, you know, I mean, we ran off everyone else, you know, big game, James, Logan. I think Logan's afraid after the way we ended last week with the, uh, the coach's argument. I think he's a little scared right now. Yeah. He kind of stood back and just kind of let us, uh, flail away at each other. And, uh, big game, James, uh, I don't know that there's a hot spot that he can find in his car. That's a, uh, going to hold up long enough. We started to go fund me to get him some Wi-Fi or something in his house. I don't know what's going on there, but you know what? I got you. It is, it is July 3rd. I'm here for you. You have broad, broad, big shoulders, Jason. I do. Thank you do. You. Figuratively. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Yes. So for anybody who missed last week's discussion slash debate, we were running through ACC coaches rankings. And so Jason had pointed out the previous week that Willie Taggart was listed by, I believe it was CBS. CBS sports. Yes. To be much too low. And you have to believe that there could be another imbecile out there who would rank Willie Taggart that low. And what crazy person would put him at 12? I don't understand who would do such a thing. Mm -hmm. And then here I am right in line with CBS sports for one of the few times, probably. And, uh, and so we, we I, I don't know that we have any other ground to cover here in regards to the Willie Taggart uh, placing on my list. Yeah. Uh, so I explained again that my one of my tenants in ranking these uh, the coaches in the various conferences, and I have found in recent years, maybe not necessarily this year, the ACC to be the most difficult conference to rank coaches in that I believe that there is less discrepancy or difference or gap between the coaches than I find in the other conferences where I see more of a hierarchy and then down the line where in the ACC, other than the obvious, uh, I've not seen that in recent years. And I, I think it also has something to do with the fact, and we've talked about this in previous weeks, and I'm sure we'll talk about it as we get closer to the season. The ACC right now does look like, and I'll admit this as an FSU grad, as somebody who covers the Knowles, it's Clemson and, in football, the 13 Dwarfs. Now, I can understand how it looks that way. Now, if you do a deep dive into the conference, you can give teams like NC State, teams like Virginia, you know, even and as much as I hate to say it, a team like Miami credit over the past couple of years. But that being said, on the surface, it's Dabo. It's a few other guys that college football insiders like you and like me might know, but to the average person, people are going to know Nick Saban. People are going to know – to an extent, Kirby Smart. They're going to know Dan Mullen because the names are big. You know, they're big produced names. Obviously, you know, the SEC has their own network. Will they, Will that help when the ACC gets their network in a month? Who knows? But it's it's just one of those things. And, and I think just what we talked about as far as with Willie, and you even admitted that you made your list at the end of last year. There's been, you know, there, there still is the constant criticism of Willie. You know, you've got, you've got trolls. On, on different cable sports networks who make comments about him and whatnot. It's even happened in the last week. I think that that once this season goes on, and I think once FSU has an eight-win season, a nine-win season in 2019, things will calm down immensely as far as the, the criticism of Willie Tiger. So I ranked a Willie Taggart at number 12 in line with CBS Sports. So in response to our video, mm -hmm. There are a number of people in addition to the people that commented in the live chat while I was uh, giving my analysis and, and you were responding that uh, responded to the no call-ins, please. Thank you very much. So uh, there were a number of people that uh, responded to the, the video once it post uh, 
during the course of the week that pointed out that, okay, Willie Taggart went five and seven, Jimbo Fisher went six and six the year before. Now, how do you make that distinguishing? Jimbo Fisher went five and six. Let, let's, let's call it what it is. Jimbo Fisher did have a losing season in his time. You know, for everyone who talks about how great he is at Texas a and he had a losing season before he bailed. Let, let's call it. Odell Higgins won those final two games. Jimbo Fisher led FSU to a losing season in his final season. Okay. Well, uh, he was given credit as the head coach for the wins and he finished seven and six, but in the regular season, he was six and six. That's the official record. You know, uh, the narrative that, uh, uh, he bailed out and that was it. And he did nothing else the last few weeks of the season and maybe little else, uh, prior to the season or prior to those final few games after the Alabama loss. Okay. My point in all of that is, in addition to the flat out record comparison, which is of course comparable six and six, five and seven is that if you go through the 2017 Florida state season and the competitive level in which the team played at each every and every week, it was much higher, drastically higher than it was this past season. Those two performances through 12 games aren't comparable. I, I understand where you're coming from, and and the more I get, I get where where the logic is with that. My comeback to that would be just using an example: the year before the 2016 season, Florida State finished the year 10 and three. That being said, a one point win over Miami, a one point win over Michigan in the Orange Bowl, a four point win over NC State. So there's three wins right there by a combined six points. You have come back from a 28 to six deficit in the opener against Ole Miss. So there's an argument right there that you are an epic, humongous comeback in the opener and six points away from, I believe that'd be nine and three. So let's say worst case scenario, you lose to Ole Miss, you lose to NC State, you lose to Miami. You're six and six right there. So that's why I think the growing criticism and the growing realization that this was not a one-time thing. 2018 was not a one-time thing for the Florida State Seminoles. 2018 was not because Willie Taggart, to hear the critics, to hear the naysayers, oh, he can't handle it. He took a bad situation. Should they have probably gone five and seven? No, absolutely not. Should they beat Miami and gone six and six at the worst and gone to a bowl game? Absolutely. That being said, the when you look at everything as a whole and you look into a deep dive into that team, to put everything on Willie Taggart would be, and I'm not saying this is you, Mark Rogers, voice of college football. Yes. You said you liked it last week, so we're going to do it every time. I'll take that every time. Absolutely, I will. So I'm going to say it again, Mark Rogers TV, voice of college football. To do, to do just a off the record alone, to me, I feel is an irresponsible thing for, and it's, it's an easier thing to do. It's easy to do it like that, but it, it takes a deep dive to realize, oh, wait, this wasn't the whole story. So the losses that particular season are coming back into play as I look at the game log. Uh, that uh, disaster at Louisville in which uh, Lamar Jackson's given a ton of credit for that win at Louisville 63-20, but it was actually the Louisville defense that played an exceptional game. And that was just that was just a disaster. Wasn't it like 35 to nothing like that? Uh, in that game. So that was one loss in that 2016 season, the first loss of the season uh, in game three. Uh, they could have easily beaten North Carolina. Now they that shouldn't be given as a b big credit that they beat North Carolina or would have, uh, but they lost on a last second field goal or was a last second field goal miss. It was a last second made by, uh, yes. by okay. North Carolina. And that that was a talented offense at North Carolina with Ryan Switzer and uh, Mitchell Trubisky and so forth, Elijah Hood and those guys. Uh, so they were a good team, a decent team. But yes, Florida State should beat North Carolina. Those two versions of those programs in Tallahassee. So that was a loss, but they 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 could have won. While you're talking about could be losses, I'm talking about could be wins. Clemson, the national champions, 37-34. And that she was really winning good. FSU was winning that game in the fourth quarter. So, yeah, they could have had that game. But you look even the year before, 2015, FSU lost to arguably, and, and we've talked about this, arguably the worst loss of the Jimbo Fisher era in Tallahassee to a bad Georgia Tech team. Yes, it was on a, a blocked field goal return to a touchdown, but that was a Georgia Tech team who I believe, and I could be wrong. They went 3-9. Right, they went 3-9 that year, yeah. and Florida State was playing horribly 
At Florida State came into that game six and zero. Oh. They had just blown out Louisville the week before, blown beaten Miami the week before that. He came in six and zero, oh, came in a top ten team, and laid an egg against arguably a, a I'll use the word horrible Georgia Tech team that season. So to to sit here, that's what I'm saying when I say people go after Willie and people in both the the media world sports media world and, and just general fans who want to blame it all on Willie. It's almost like starting in 2014, you see all these close wins and there starts to be more and more close wins, close wins. And then you point out the North Carolina loss, the Georgia tech loss, the 2017 season, how the losses start to pile up. This was a Jimbo Fisher, the end of the Jimbo Fisher era. I'd say the last three seasons of it, were the the beginnings of a disaster in Tallahassee. All right, Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. This is your Florida State Seminoles live show each and every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. So don't be selfish. Just don't take this as your own. Invite your family, your friends, your Florida State fans, college football fans. Uh, if you notice in the live chat, there are fans of all sorts of teams that yeah. uh, pick us out each and every Wednesday night. So Bring more in. We would love to crank up the total too. Let's get to a thousand by the beginning of the season. My my aim is high. Do it. We get a couple thousand views by the time it uh, sits there for a week. But uh, I'm talking about live while we're here, uh, getting ready for Boise State, and we will preview that game. There was a number of requests this week to say, "Hey, preview Boise State." We will. We will uh, break that down. Believe me, for weeks we will do that once we get into. Um, August camp. Let's do that. We all well, thank, thank God that we're less than two months to go to a college football season. I believe. Can we, can we say that real quick? Again, it's a double-edged sword for me. I say this every time it's brought up about, I can't wait to get to football season. Well, I, I like the summer. <laughs> so yes, I love football as much as anybody out there. Believe can, me, I do. You can have the summer. I will take the football season. <laughs> I know you will. Uh, I'll take the first half of the fall season here yeah, in Connecticut. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll take it until about the first or second week of October, typically. Uh, that 2017 team, just to wrap up the synopsis, they did have to play Alabama in a neutral site game, and it was uh, a 24-7 final, but it was a game in doubt into the fourth quarter. Uh, they lost to North Carolina State, as you well remember, the next week by six points. And again, the other point I was making to the detractors commenting back to me in defense of Willie Taggart and uh, taking shots at Jimbo Fisher 6-16 six and 16 the year before, I let them know, you know, Jimbo had DeAndre Francois, who was coming off uh, a fine sophomore season, ready to go, or right. a freshman season, uh, ready to go, coming off the Orange Bowl win, and boom, he did have his quarterback taken away from him in game one and had to go with a guy that was not ready as a freshman in James Blackman. So let's understand that as well. And and and, and I've talked about this with several FSU. So so let's we'll be positive for one moment. Okay, let's say DeAndre Francois does not get hurt. And and what I'm about to say is not an attack towards James Blackman because I think he will do a, a good job this year, you know, in his 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 redshirt sophomore season, third year in school, second year as the starter for this team. If DeAndre Francois does not get hurt against Alabama, out of the one, two, three, four, out of the five losses left that that FSU had in that regular season, NC State, Miami, Louisville, Boston College, and Clemson. I think you have a legitimate argument that Florida State could have won four of those games. I think he beats NC State. It, this is, once again, best-case scenario. The sky is, is blue and perfect and rainbows and unicorns and everything. I think they beat NC State that year with DeAndre Francois. I think they beat Miami. I think they beat Louisville. And I'm going to say it. I think they beat Clemson that year because, once again, when, when people talk about the Clemson dominance over FSU and Clemson – killed FSU last year. There's no sugarcoating that. The three years before, Florida State was tied in the fourth quarter against Clemson in 2015, had the lead in the fourth quarter against Clemson in 2016, and was down by three points with five minutes to go and had the ball against Clemson in 2017. The 2017 version, there were, there were plenty of mistakes that were made by Blackman, by that FSU offense, in that game. Well, are those same mistakes made with Francois? I don't think so. So the argument there could be, is FSU a 9-win, 10-win team in 2017? Does that keep Jimbo Fisher around for the 2018 season, or does he take the $75 million? 
you know, there, that's why I'm saying it's a lot easier for us to look back and say, well, what happened if, if A happens and then B happens and C happens? The bottom line is, is FSU fans can't go back. The 2013 team is not coming back. The, the detractors, the haters on Willie Taggart need to realize that what took place last season was years in the making. It was a three-year, two, three-year slippery slope that led to what happened last season. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. This is your Florida State uh, Seminoles live show every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. So we appreciate everyone on the live chat. I will get to it in just a second. As soon as I throw something at Jason and he uh, expounds for a few minutes, I can uh, expounds. Are you able to do that for us, Jason? I think I can do that for you. I can give you five minutes of, of, of spiel. I and I will uh, come up with, uh, so leave your comments and questions. Not that I can get to everyone, but leave your comments and questions in the uh, live chat and we will get to those. So if I run through the rest of my ACC coaches okay. rankings, uh, after Willie at 12, mm -hmm. then I go up to Dave Doran, who I'm not as impressed with as many people. Uh, basically North Carolina state he's recruited. Well, he's had some teams over the last couple of years that appeared to have a shot preseason to take a shot at Clemson and have been in that game other than the first Clemson national championship run in 2016, where NC stated had they had the kicker make the kick, they would have beaten Clemson on the road, you know, eight and five, seven and six, seven and six, nine and four, nine and four. Uh, that's what I expect out of NC State, and many of those records have been puffed up by bad, weak non-conference uh, mm -hmm. opponents. So I just don't see it with Dave Doran. I just, I, I think his teams have been unprepared and have been outclassed in big games, and they just haven't gotten over the hump. They've beaten everyone that they should for the most part, and um, they've taken advantage of bad non-conference uh, scheduling. Pat Narduzzi, I have a ten. I think people would be surprised with this statistic. Pat Narduzzi and Pitt are 20 and 12 in the ACC since 2015. That's his ACC wow. record, 20 and 12. Only Miami is better at 21 and 11. Despite the seven losses last year, they went six and two in the conference. I did not realize that. Um, That's why you're Mark Rogers TV. It wasn't called trouble. You, you got you to gotta find this stuff. Uh, he's 28 and 24 overall, but again, uh, winning record uh, like a plus 65 percent winning percentage uh but the defense uh, you would expect him to master the defense there that, that's how he got the job because at michigan state he was a guru and the pit defense has not been good uh he's 0 three in bowl games uh steve adazio i've got at number nine he's cranked out a lot of seven and six seasons seven and five this past year because they didn't play the bowl game uh had the one down year but um, basically seven and six five times in six years so you know what you get with boston college and the recruiting classes are not good there. He makes them work. Obviously, they fit what he does, but athletically, they're not. Uh, you know, he he knows what he's doing, though. He knows the identity of his program, and he drives it home with the uh, the stout defense in the run game. I think you you've hit the nail on the head. We've talked about this um, off the air before. He is someone who works very good with what he has. He knows that, you know, he knows that you're at Boston College, you're at a decent program, but you're not a team that is going to be competing for many national titles. He does very well with what he has, and he's done a very good job about building Boston College, what I would use the term, a respectable program. I, I would definitely use the term respectable when I talk about Boston College. And to touch on Dave Doran for one second before you continue with your list, the thing that, that, that got me last year was when people were saying why, oh, James Blackman should start should start over uh, DeAndre Francois towards the end of the year. And they point out, oh, well, he threw for 400 yards against NC State. NC State finished, I believe it was 117th last year in pass defense, which boggles my mind because I will agree with you there. On paper, when Dave Doran came in, it was, oh, he's going to, you know, NC State's going to be a team that's going to compete as one of the, the better teams. In the division, I think the best they've done since he's been there, I want to say, is third in the Atlantic division. So there's going to come a point where he is going to have to, you know, do his job or, or they are going to have to move on to NC State. I think this is going to be a huge year for him. They lost some key components from last year, but if it's a, a six and six season, regular season, six and six, seven and five, that, that could be the hottest seat in the ACC. 
His conference record is 20 and 28. And for most of that time, Wake Forest has been marginal. Before they rose to respectability here in the last three years, they were awful. Syracuse has been awful up until this past season. So he's had some teams to beat up on, and still he's 20 and 28 in the conference. You, sh you should go 500 at NC State in conference play. Oh, I, I would agree. That's And that's what boggles it with it is. and. And you hit the nail on the head. Now he's, they start off the year with East Carolina. They start off the year with, with – they start off with East Carolina, then they play Western Carolina. So you figure you're 2-0 and there. Then you got to go play at West Virginia. Then you got Ball State at home. So, yeah, you made the point. It's kind of a, a subpar, you know, non-conference slate. You know, they'll probably get annihilated by West Virginia, just throwing that out there. And then you start off with an ACC slate where they come to Tallahassee and then they play at Syracuse. So it's one of those things, you know, are you a three and three team? Then all of a sudden you're a three and three team with, with Clemson left on the schedule. You go to Boston College, to Wake Forest, you know, and if North Carolina has people who are on the Mac Brown train, could, could that be a losing season in Raleigh? Right here? Their non-conference schedule last year was James Madison, Georgia State, East Carolina, and Marshall. Listen, my ex-wife is from Northern Virginia. Don't mess with the Dukes of James Madison, okay? They're the fighting Dukes. They've right. won national championships, haven't they've they? Won, they've won more national titles than FSU recently, yes. Okay. Number eight, Dino Babers. Now, people tend to rate him higher one season. I want to see more. Okay. Uh, and it was a good season. They were the second seed in the ACC. They earned that, but it was a down ACC they took advantage. Did they beat any really good teams? The best team that Syracuse beat last year was the aforementioned Wolfpack of North Carolina State. That was the best win that they had in the regular season last year at 9-3. and three. Mm -hmm. uh, They were fortunate not to run into West Virginia's four or five best offensive players. No Will Greer, two best wide receivers, left tackle that went to the NFL, all didn't play the bowl game. So they still have to go out there and play and credit them with a win, but it's a bit, uh, I take those things into consideration. So four and eight, four and eight, 10 and three. Great, Dino Babers. Nice job. It's a difficult place to win. Uh, you're in the North. Uh, you have okay talent in New York and New Jersey, but that's about all you can draw from unless you want to take the leftovers from Florida, which he's done. Uh, so it's a difficult place like Boston College to win. Uh, so I would expect if Dino Babers can consistently go, Seven and five, eight and four. A down year would be five or six wins, and then you know a nine and three. I would give him a lot of credit for that. And I think I think that they will go down one one slot. I guess you will this year. I don't think they're a double digit win team this season. Uh, I agree with you. I think it was a very good year. I ranked him a little bit higher on my list because I was impressed with what they did. I'll disagree with you a little bit and call me a homer. I think their biggest win was was not just beating FSU, but having a dominating second half against FSU because I think that was the game that, on paper, before the game, FSU struggled in the open against Virginia Tech. They were supposed to go to Syracuse, handle their business, and Syracuse both shut FSU out in the first half and then absolutely dominated in the second half. And I think that was where people kind of realized, oh, wait, Syracuse, is a, that's a decent team because we didn't see how the season was going to play out yet for FSU. So I would maybe say that was probably a bigger win because by the time they played NC State, they had already had some respectability. The Florida State big win kind of put Syracuse on the map last season. So, so Jason, I don't disagree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going the thinking route, which, which I guess I didn't take the time to do that. Uh, but basically, I was just going the cold, hard facts. NC State had the best record of the best team that they beat on the schedule. But yes, in regards to brand and the setup for the rest of the season it was still early they were still trying to figure things out and who are we and confidence and all that factoring in uh yeah beating florida state and really taking out the seminoles so once they hit sometime in the second quarter um halftime i think it was a fairly close game at that point but uh 30 to 7 yeah uh yeah. biggest win if you take it into context uh nine and four nc state best win on paper Justin Fuente, I have at number seven. He was largely disappointing, obviously, this last year. That's the first losing season at Virginia Tech in forever, close to 30 years. Uh, I thought it was a really good hire. I also look at the Memphis. So I'm grading 
there, there's if you could almost put it on a scale or a weighted system, sure. Um, I'm taking more into account of what happened in 2018, 17, 16, and, and it dissipates as you go backwards. But I'm still going to credit him with uh, turning around Memphis, getting to conference championships games there, and then going to Virginia Tech. He goes to an ACC championship game. And sure, he was playing with Frank Beamer's team, but Frank Beamer wasn't going to ACC championship games recently. And he went there and he played a Clemson team that that was the national championship team in the ACC title game, 45-37, really good game. You know, I was in the game. Uh, yeah, they had the one last year was a similar to Florida State kind of season where uh, they went six and six. They lost the bowl game, so they were a notch better. And obviously they won the head to head decisively in the second half. Uh, but they looked pretty ugly, too. Obviously, the old Dominion loss wow. and, and some other losses. So I'm not going to I knocked him down because of the I don't know what I ranked him last year, maybe four or five. I knocked him down based on the uh, performance from last season, but this was a really, really, really young team, and they got hit with just defections and injuries going into 2018 as well. Um, I'm giving him credit for beating Virginia, which was a pretty good football team, and now they've won like 15 straight against Virginia, so that's almost automatic. All right, this is where we're going to disagree. I know it. Scott Satterfield at number six. Go on. I am going to give. I will let you speak, and then 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 I will respond. Okay. Had he accomplished what he accomplished at Appalachian State, at Kansas State, Stanford, a Power Five school, okay. sure, I would give him tons more credit, significantly more credit. Okay. But where he was placed, his job, he played at a pretty formidable school on the Group of Five level, probably a top. 60 program in FBS, a program that's good enough to be better than a handful of power five teams mm -hmm. typically. Uh, so about a top 60 program in the nation. And he's won the Sunbelt conference championship three consecutive years, uh, 38 and 10 in the conference. He's, he's known as having a great offensive mind, being a tremendous play caller. I think he's ready for the job and this is where I'm placing him. Okay. And the criticism of that would be from my side of the spectrum. Yeah. And and this was my argument with and, and I think this is the deeper question about ranking, and like you said, how you ranked your list initially right at the end of last season and whatnot. Do I think Scott Satterfield is a, a bad coach? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. And, and this means no disrespect towards towards group of five schools, towards Appalachian State, the Mountaineers, everyone else. To sit there and say somebody who spent his time coaching Appalachian State, and I'm I'm pulling up right now, he has spent spent six seasons co coaching Appalachian State. To sit here and say that, that he is is miles ahead of somebody who has experience at big power five schools in Willie Tiger, that is my issue with it. Do I think Scott Satterfield has the potential? Does he have the ability? Yes. And what he did at Appalachian State was very good. Like you said, three straight Sun Belt titles. You know, he got the New Orleans Bowl, the Dollar General Bowl, and whatnot. If he can turn Louisville, I'll say this. If he takes Louisville from a 2-10 and 10 team to, let's say, 6-6, six and six, let's say they're a 500 ball club next year, I will give him all the credit in the world. But to automatically put rank him above and, and, and very decently above Willie Taggart without him even coaching a down at a Power 5 school yet, that is my issue. And that was my issue all along. My issue with the rankings, the coaches – was and when when you first said off camera that you had had Willie at twelve below coaches who have not who are first year coaches in the ACC, that's what got me. Is how can you rank somebody who's a first year coach well ahead of somebody who has an ex, has experience coaching in the ACC? That was my issue with the rankings. So Scott Satterfeld, I'm going to give him all the credit, give him all the respect, but I'm going to also rank him with a grain of a very heavy, nice kosher salt. Nice, I think. 
nice Passover salt that we have on the Passover table. Nice. Grain of salt. Yes. It's a it's big a, grain of salt. A, a, a large grain. So just to educate people on how I approach this and how I'll look at it most likely next season would be Scott Satterfield. Okay, Louisville. He walks into a mess. Let's say it's still a mess. Mm -hmm. Then he's kind of on a holding pattern and he probably takes it. Let's say they're nearly as bad. Uh, he probably drops back because some of the guys behind him probably show a little bit more worth. And then he probably drops back from six to nine or 10, most likely. Mm -hmm. If he gets anything out of that situation, when you say six and six, I'm even thinking if he improves by two games, if they're a four and eight team that's competitive in the majority of their conference games, you know, they're losing a lot of, you know, 31, 17 games where they're not getting blown off the field, but they're, they're in the game in the second half. I'm going to give a lot of credit to that because this team was just deplorable last year. They were horrible, and and let's and you you hit the nail on the head when you say and you look at their schedule this upcoming season. I mean, you open with Notre Dame. This is a playoff team. Yes, I yes Clemson exposed them in the Cotton Bowl to an extent, but this is also was a team that was one of the top four teams in the country entering the bowl season last year. Then they play East Carolina. They play a Western or excuse me, East excuse me, I apologize, Eastern Kentucky. Then they play a Western Kentucky team who. I think on athletes alone, I think Louisville can win that game in a close one. Then you have a slate of ACC games that includes at FSU, Boston College, at Wake Forest, Clemson, Virginia, Miami. You know, your, your two cross-division games this year are Virginia and Miami. And then you've got NC State, Syracuse. Then you close the year at Kentucky. So, yeah, that's why I, I would I would say if, if he can go 6-6, six and six, let's say in a perfect world he can go 6-6, six and six, somehow get to 500. I would argue him as one of the top three coaches in the ACC. But, yeah, realistically, yeah, if he can get I'll, – I'll, I'll give you that one, Mark Rogers, TV voice of college football. If he can get two more wins and be a 4-8 and eight team, I will give him much more, more credit. Jason said it. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. This is our live uh, show with Florida State front and center, 7 o'clock every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern time. So lock it in. Uh, it's time to get locked in. College football is right around the corner. We'll have ACC media days in about uh, a couple weeks, right into the open of fall camp. So this is the place to be. Yes, we will answer all your questions. We will jump on it in regards to Boise State previews and positional breakdowns across the field on both sides of the football for Florida State, recruiting, everything. We do it here every week. So that if this is one of the first times that you've joined us, the, either the first time or um, one of the first times, certainly jump back into the um, archives there and check out all the videos because we have covered Florida State football uh, top to bottom uh, through six weeks now. And we're doing a little ACC survey looking at the coaches. And I got David Cutcliffe at number five, Jason. I just think uh, if you look at his, you just have to understand the context of uh, Duke football, where it stands at the university, obviously, with a backseat to basketball, which is rare mm -hmm. for any Power Five program. You've got about five basketball schools and then everybody else. It's football first. Uh, David Cutcliffe got there for a program that hadn't won a bowl game since the 1961 Cotton Bowl. They hadn't been to a bowl game since 1995. And yeah, it took him a long time to turn this around. So the prior coach, Ted Roof, if you remember Ted Roof. I do. Went 4-42. and 42. This is what he took over, David Cutcliffe, 4-42. and 42. Now, it didn't turn around on a dime. You know, he, he had his 4-8s and 3-9s, and, and but 67-72 and 72 overall, but that's 14 games over 500 the last five seasons. Um, won the Coastal Division Championship inexplicably to some 2013. They've been to six bowl games in seven years when they hadn't been to one since 1995. And the guy just beyond the numbers and the turnaround there at Duke, and they probably hit their ceiling, you know, winning a division championship. And now there's been a lot of eight and five, seven and sixes since then. That's probably where they, they're going to max out. But he's held them there. He's kept them there. I think they went four and eight a few years ago. But basically, they're going to bowl games every year. And in addition to the, the record and what he's done there, you just hear great things of David Cutcliffe. He has garnished just a lot of respect in the coaching fraternity. Yeah, and I think if you look at it, for example, you, you mentioned how, yeah, he has a 67-72 record at Duke. But you know, you're five games under 500 total in your time at Duke. 
but you were 19 games under 500 your first five seasons. So look at, like you said, the t- you had the 10 win season in 2013. I'm trying to remember who, who beat them in the ACC championship. Who blew them mm. out? It was Florida State. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. I forgot for a second. But yeah, but you hit the nail on the head, and I had him at number four on my list because of that fact of I do give some credence to the fact that he has made Duke a team that is a, is a nine win team, an eight win team, which I'm sorry, I grew up in the, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, when I was a fan of FFU and later a student there of Duke was homecoming or Duke was the easy first game of the year where you would dominate them by 50 points. That's what Duke football was. Got 60 folks on the line watching Florida State uh, Seminoles Live. We appreciate uh, your support. Yes, I will get to the uh, the chat room in just a second. We've got about 15 more minutes on the air. Uh, you can help us a number of ways. Of course, you like the videos. So for as many people watching, we should get some likes. We'll have about two, 3,000. We'll watch it eventually. I uh, got 60 on the line right now live, so we appreciate you stopping by. But remember to hit that like button, comment in the live chat, comment afterwards to any of the videos. Uh, if you see what we do elsewhere, if you're just a Florida State person, maybe you love college football overall, but you especially love Florida State, well, check out the other videos as well. I'm, just, I'm, I'm running through my schedule ranking 70 all the way up to number one. I believe Florida State was number 38, if I recall. Uh, da, 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 da. We're doing position uh, breakdowns of tons of Power 5 teams who've done close to like 100 videos on position breakdowns. And I'm going to reel in Jason, Logan, some of these guys to uh, help us out on Florida State. Yeah, so all sorts of position previews, all sorts of previews, and just more than you can imagine. Top five SEC quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, top five ACC quarterbacks, wide receivers. We've done all this stuff that you got to dive into. Okay, Dave Clawson, I've got it number four. I'm just amazed at what he's accomplished, and now I'm even rethinking the number four ranking I have for him. You've mentioned Dave Clawson a lot during this six weeks. So I'm just throwing that out there, too. Wake Forest, Wake Forest. He's won three straight bowl games. Mm-hmm. It's just he he takes over an awful program. Jim Grobe uh, made it a decent program at one point, but during the end of his tenure, they were awful. They were winning three games. It took him three years. They were awful when they started out. Took over a bad program. First two years, he's three and nine, three and nine. Since then. Man, he's he's taken a deplorable offense. They're an exciting offense now. He's been able to recruit offensive players and develop them. Mm-hmm. Go back, anybody who follows football and is kind of a nerd that likes to look at numbers, just, just go back like five years, pull up Wake Forest offensive statistics, game to game, the entire season. It was just, you know, they had running backs running for like 3.2 yards per carry. They, they just had nothing. And, uh, He's won three straight bowl games. He's gone seven and six or eight and five, three straight years at Wake Forest. My comeback to that would be, and I ranked him lower, much, much, much lower on my oh, list. Okay. Grove led them to an ACC championship, led them to an Orange Bowl, led them to multiple bowl games, multiple winning seasons. Yes, there were there were some embarrassing losing seasons in that group too, but you know, Wake Forest has always been a team that, and FSU fans will understand this, I use the Chris Ricks theory. Wake Forest would always be the team that would somehow beat, you know, a number two Clemson team and then would somehow lose to, to a bad Duke team back in the early 2000s and the 90s. That They were always a hot and cold team. That, that would be the best way to describe Wake Forest. So that's why I don't give Clawson all the credit in the world because you're talking about two, you know, the last three years of three bowls, the only reason they're above 500 is because of bowl wins. Two seven and six seasons and an eight and five season. I'll give you the eight and five season, big bowl win over Texas AM. i I'll give you that much. But I need more from him before I, I up him much higher on the list. All right. I've got him at number four. And I'm going to guess, Jason, that if we went down through Wake Forest history during the time frame that you're talking about, I can't imagine that they were beating number two ranked teams in the country very often. Was just using an ever. Example. I was using an example. I'm still mad about t- 2006 when they shut us out in Tallahassee. Still mad about that. Still have PTSD. Okay, here's another guy I'm high on. Bronco Mendenhall at number three. I agree with that one. 
At BYU, okay, what's BYU been since he left? They finally got back to a bowl game and went seven and six this past year. They've been winning like three, four, five games since he left. Mm -hmm. He comes to Virginia. They hadn't been to a bowl game in 10 or 11 years. He gets to a bowl game his second season. The first season, again, I I leave some leeway for adjustment. Okay. I know I didn't necessarily do that with Willie, but he's got top 15 talent, number one. And number two, just the team didn't look prepared but you see a lot of good coaching stints from, from some of the top coaches when they take over a bad program or a program that's been down. And you see where that first season, the record doesn't increase much, mm -hmm. but the team just plays much better. Uh, so Bronco Mend Mendenhall, had, he had his 2-10 and 10 out of the gate at Virginia, but he was changing things. Okay. Uh, then he wins six and gets to a bowl game. And then this past season, eight and five, they win a bowl game. They beat an SEC team, South Carolina, 28 to nothing in the bowl game. And again, if you look back at BYU during his time, they were, they were ranked many of those seasons. They were like a top 25 type program at that point. He went 99 and 43 at BYU and they haven't touched that since. Um, so again, the jury's still out of Virginia, but the signs at this point are really good. If he is, is, if they can do anything close to what they did this past year, I think you could easily see them in Charlotte winning the coastal division. I think they, they can, they, I believe have the talent They're, That's a scary game. I think before Clemson, that to me is the one game that scares me the most as an FSU fan uh, covering the team, that that I can see that being the most likely that FSU loses before they play Clemson. This year. I, I have Miami fans get on here almost on a daily basis and, and laugh at uh, my warning about Virginia. And I'm not saying Virginia is going to win or win the division. They do have to travel to Miami, but where fan bases get off making fun of a program that just beat you the previous season and won one more game. I don't really understand that logic. At the risk of starting World War III with Miami fans, so I will say that there are FSU fans who are like it too. There is a there's a decent amount of fans, and you know this covering college football, that are still living in the 90s, living in the 2000s. There are people who expect everything to just be like it used to be, and it's not. College football is a different animal. It's not. Florida State, Florida, Miami, Notre Dame, USC, you know, Alabama, and then a bunch of other schlubs down there. You know, Duke can beat an FSU. You know, Baylor can beat Oklahoma. It, anything can happen. This is this is where we are at right now. Talking college football, he's here each and every Wednesday night. Uh, Florida State at 7 o'clock, Miami at 8, Ohio State at 9, all Eastern time. We got Jason Parker on the line. Join him. At Chop Chat, uh, what have you been carving up there at uh, Chop Chat here recently, Jason? Chat, we are in the month of July, so we are uh, we are going through our how do we get to football season soon section uh, of the month. Uh, today we talk about a uh, a certain member of the sports media who took a shot at Willie Taggart, so we respond to that a little bit. Also uh, on the recruiting side, uh, we talk about how. Could FSU get lucky in a uh, four-star offensive line target, uh, Isaiah Walker, who's from uh, South Florida, from Miami, Norland High School, who recently uh, decommitted from South Carolina. He's been a big target of FSU of late. Uh, obviously, Florida and Miami have also been looking at him. So can Florida State uh, end up getting there? And then also how the FSU baseball team could be in a rebuilding cycle entering next season under Mike Martin Jr. That's what we. That's our latest stuff on ChopChat.com. All right, good stuff. Lock it in there. Lock it in here. Florida State fans, college football fans, we deliver uh, the best in discussion, debate, and analysis each and every day. Check out the videos. Uh, we've uh, posted more than eight thousand, and we post them every day, four or five, and we are getting you set for twenty nineteen. Also, you can contribute by uh, joining the super chat right here. Contribute there. Also, the Amazon link is in the description section below. So. 71 people on the line right now. A couple thousand are going to watch this. I'm guessing some of you, I'm just guessing based on what I've heard about this Amazon outfit, 
that uh, you shop at Amazon. You can grab the link in the description section. Your Amazon experience does not change in any way, but you help contribute to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And you can also grab the link that you see down below where it says voice of college football community. Grab that link and you can join me for two exclusive live streams each and every week. One in which I respond to your viewer comments, which total more than 40,000 this year. So thank you for the big response. Uh, that's up from about, I was looking at this the other day because we just hit the first six months of, uh, of course, 2019. So about 40 some thousand compared to like 16,000 at this point last year. So thank you for the, the, the comments just flooding in. And then on top of that, uh, I respond to your viewer comments. The other live stream, I bring you on to talk college football with me. So the, the, the vision here is that, uh, we rotate three or four of you all the time to come on, talk college football with me. How can you beat that, Jason? You, you can jump on, talk to the, the voice of college football. I'm here every Wednesday. So <laughs> I know you've got your spot. I would uh, not have a chance to talk to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Yeah. I, I don't know how you got to be so privileged, but, uh, it's just, I responded the luck of the draw, I guess. I responded to your Twitter. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's it's been good stuff here with uh, Jason each and every week. He's joined us all six weeks. This is our sixth edition. We got uh, Logan Robinson uh, most of the time from a Knoll Game Day. Big James uh, Coleman. We'll see if we can reel James back in here, and we'll finish out our ACC coaches list here because I think this is where we're going to hit a snag, a so major got, snag. You've got Dabo at number two, <laughs> right? No, no, no. So this gentleman has been uh, off the scene for a few years. We've seen him with makeup on in the studio. And uh, he's he's got a few years behind him, which there's the track record. If you say Mac Brown is the number one coach in the ACC, so help me God. Mac Brown would be number two. I, I'm, I'm not. I was hoping that you did not even rank him at number one. No, 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 no. Oh. But you take exception to number two as well. I take mass exception because he is a, a, a first year coach. I, I get the critics here. Oh, you coached North Carolina before. It's his first time back at this stint. I have a problem with him, especially because of the fact that he has not coached on the sidelines since 2013. I think that goes back to how you say Miami fans in the message room, FSU fans constantly living in the past. People who think just because he's coming back to North Carolina – that you're going to have the same type of coach, the same type of team for the Tar Heels that they had in 97 when, when they were a top five team before he left to go to Texas. It's not going to happen. It, it, it's not, and I'm sorry. And I'm, it's, it's not me being critical towards anyone in Chapel Hill to think that he is going to be the same coach that was in there two decades ago, I personally think is crazy. And I'm not a big Mac Brown supporter. I, I thought near the end of his uh, tenure in Texas that uh, he got a little lazy mm -hmm. and uh, he lost his energy in the recruiting uh, wars and uh, they slipped. They certainly slipped. But man, we got to see what Charlie Strong, who had been extremely successful at Louisville, what he was not able to do with the same players and then not able to replenish the roster at the same rate as Mac Brown. So let's keep a few things in mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am rating this on the here and now. So I, I try to, but you know how complex this can become when you start to rate and rank uh, and you try to hold to certain guidelines. But then you've got a coach who is very, very well respected and very, very um, accomplished. Uh, come back onto the scene. Now, this is not a Herm Edwards situation where he hasn't stepped on a football field for 12 or 13 years. Six years. 2013. Okay. It's been a while, but it's not like he coached the wing T. Uh, he, he, <laughs> he dealt with basically the same generation and the same style of football. It has changed a bit, but I'm going to trust in Mac Brown's ability to run a program and more so than actually know the nuts and bolts and the X's and O's on the field, but run the program. And if you look at what he accomplished in North Carolina, so prior to Mac Brown, marginal. He 
finished ranked in his last six seasons at North Carolina and six seasons at North Carolina five times. Think about North Carolina being ranked like consistently every year, twice in the top 10 in the nation. Just that's tough to pin it. Even that Mitchell Trubisky team with all that talent finished eight and five. They didn't come anywhere close to being ranked that high. He finished top 10 twice at North Carolina. Then he goes to Texas. And sure, it's easy to say Texas talent, Texas talent. Obviously, anybody can win there. Well, not everybody can win there because they weren't winning before he got there. They hadn't won a national championship since the early 70s, somewhere around 69 or 70. And uh, that had been forever, 25 years. He wins a national championship. He gets to another national championship game to back up that that wasn't a fluke. He was in the conversation for a national championship consistently year after year after year after year. And I'll say this real quick. I think it's in the top 10, six times. If Cole McCoy doesn't get hurt, I think they beat Alabama in 2009. I'll say it right now. I think that. I believe good. so too. Uh, that was a, tw so people look at the final score, 37, 21, 24, 21 game, five minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, won the national championship. And again, just compare the winning percentages before and after, not at one program, at two major programs. It's, it's drastic. My comeback to that, and, and 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 we can wrap things up with these guys on this one because obviously there's no need to talk about Dabo. We know Dabo's Dabo Sweeney. He's the best coach right now, I think, in college football. My argument with Mac Brown would be I get where you're coming from. My comeback to that would be he's going to be coaching guys this year who were in sixth grade the last time he coached on a football field, who many of them, if not all of them, weren't even getting – looks weren't even thought of as oh i'm gonna play college football yet the last time this man coached a college a college football game that would be my argument why once again i don't put new coaches i think that they all four new coaches in the acc mac brown scott satterfield manny diaz and jeff collins must start at the bottom once again just my opinion must start at the bottom because they have not shown yet what they can do if mac brown comes in this year Yes, I think he's a great leader, you know, former Florida State football player. But what if they go in this year and he's a 2-10 and 10 coach? Yes, I think he was a great leader at North Carolina in the 90s. I think he was a great leader at Texas in the, in the first part of the 2000s. But that does not, to me, translate into what he is going to do this time around in the second go-around. Now, I will, present, I will throw something at you, Mark Rogers, TV and Voice of College Football, because – during your rankings, you said you talked about Justin Fuente, who I think is a very good coach at Virginia Tech, and you talked about his time at Memphis, and you gave him credit for that. What does Willie Taggart have to do? <laughs> Didn't we talk about this last week? Go what, ahead. What does he have to do to move up from 12th on your list? Well, it, it, it's a fluid list. Uh, there are other components. It's not rated in a vacuum. If we were, I was ranking him from zero to a hundred and I said, he's a 55, then he could do something to be a 58 or an 85 or whatever next year. So there's fluidity. There's, there's guys. So that taken into context, again, I get your point. What does he have to do to move up? I, Florida, I think Florida State. I don't number five. What does he have to do to move up in your mind to be one of the top five coaches in the ACC? I think Florida State, if you take a capable football coach, if we had God come down and he said, you got 130 teams in FBS, here's your 65th ranked football coach, the average guy who's, who's capable. And, and I, I said this last week, I think most of these guys are very capable. Right. So in some leagues, I'm ranking guys 11th, 12th that I think are good coaches. Okay. So these guys know what they're doing. That's why they get paid a lot of money and it's tough to keep these jobs. I think that Florida State, they do have a difficult schedule. They've got the two really tough non-conference games, Florida, Boise State. Most teams don't play two very difficult Power 5 teams. Um, of course, have to take on Miami out of division. What's the other non-division game? Uh, Virginia. Yes. Yeah, you just said that. So they most likely play the two best teams in the other division. Difficult schedule. All right. I think this is uh, against all things being equal, even schedule. This is an eight and four team. If he goes eight and four, I'm going to basically say that's a capable showing. That's 
It's not outstanding. Now, if they go eight and four and Florida beats them on a last second field goal, you know, and they're this close that they are playing really good. Um, that, that could be different. Yeah. They, they, they're competitive with Clemson. They only, you know, they lose a respectable game, you know, 31, 20 or something like that. Yeah. And then I'm like, yeah, I, I, I always put the record into context. Um, that that's kind of my where I think they are, okay. athletically, talent wise. So yes. eight, win, eight wins or more is what you think Willie has to do this season. In the summer. If he goes more than eight and four, then I'm going to give him credit. Okay. And then you throw the bowl game in there, depending on who they play and where they are, and so forth. Yeah, that's that's kind of my barometer. I think this is an eight and four team. And I will leave you with this. I think you will be pleasantly surprised with what FSU football will do this season. And we'll talk more in the coming weeks, but I, I think you will be pleasantly surprised with this team. With you. I tr do truly believe that. I'm not just saying that's the FSU grad or anything else. I, I legitimately can see this team, if you include the bowl game, possibly having double-digit wins by the time the season's up. Well, I will say I'm not pleasantly surprised, but I am pleased – with our show through six weeks here, we got uh, Jason Parker on the line from Chop Chat. He's joined us each and every week. For those of you joining us for the first time, we us usually have a panel of a few of us on the line. Logan uh, Robinson from uh, Noel Game Day, Big James Coleman, a former FSU player at uh, Fifth Quarter College Football. So we invite you in each and every week, 7 o'clock Eastern time. Please, again, let other people know that we're here. Get on social media. Let uh, folks know. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, 7 o'clock on every Wednesday night uh, right here and join Jason on Chop Chat. So in future weeks, yeah, we're going to run through positions. We're going to talk about whatever is newsworthy, obviously, if there are late-breaking stories. But um, other than that, we're going to dive through these position rankings uh, or positions, I should say, position previews on the Florida State team and uh, look at this Boise State game. And then once we hit camp, we'll get some news, certainly, and uh, we'll respond to that each and every week. Can you, send Jason? Me a, can you send me a list of this stuff? I didn't know I'd have homework. Good enough. You got homework. Oh, God, man. Come on. But with you, it's not homework. It's it's all just, it just streams right out. I mean, I may already have the sheets and the stuff already done, so it's okay. Yeah, they, that's right. You got that other thing going over, that uh, chip chat, chop tam. What, wow. what you, that's fire. Got that going. Yeah. Chop chat. So you hear what Jason brings here? get more from him and the rest of the staff there at uh, Chop Chat. Thank you so much, Jason. It's always a good time. Sir, take it easy. See you next Wednesday. We'll see you. Hey, everybody, we've got Miami football coming at uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time. In one minute, I better shut this down and get the other link out there. So just keep it right here on the front page of YouTube. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Miami is coming up next.